I, uh, I'd like to welcome everyone to uh, this uh, inaugural joint webinar of the Energy Efficiency Council and the Energy Research Institutes Council for Australia. Um, welcome everyone. Uh, I see a few um, familiar names popping up in the, uh, in the guest list here and look forward to, to a few more people joining us as we go. Um, thanks everyone for making the time and I uh, really appreciate the fact that, uh, that we have, uh, maybe all of us got a bit of Zoom fatigue after the last year and a half. So always heartening to see people uh, coming to these um, presentations. So I'm Ariel Liebman, I'm a professor in data science and AI at uh, Monash University is in the university in the Faculty of Information Technology. And um, I'm chair of the Energy Research Institute's Council of for Australia for this year, 2021. Also a director of the Monash Energy Institute and um, also a program leader in the Race for 2030 Cooperative Research Center. So I wear a few different hats this year, which uh, gets me, keeps me pretty busy. Um, so this, this uh, webinar is run as part of uh, an activity of the Energy Research Council's Institute for Australia. And um, we, we at Monash get to chair this for the second year. I've taken over from Professor Jack Jasiniak uh, from last year. And um, this, this is a great opportunity to collaborate with industry. And uh, one, one, this is our first um, joint webinar with uh, an industry association, uh, the Energy Efficiency Council. So Erica, just briefly, is um, a recognition by universities that um, the energy transition is coming. Uh, a lot of universities already um, uh, established institutes over the last 10 years or so, and um, really fe felt that we need a more coordinated approach to work with industry, government, and the community to provide uh, a, a more coordinated level of response, support, and independent thought. So we've already ran one conference a couple of years ago, State of Energy Research Conference, and. Uh, we are going to be running another one this year. So um, thanks to Ken Baldwin at ANU for helping establish and chair Erica and run the conference in 2019. And um, Monash will be running and chairing the conference this year in December 7th, 8th and 9th. It'll probably be a hybrid conference seeing as uh, yeah, we are not uh, past COVID yet, unfortunately. The collaboration with EEC is something that uh, I'd like to thank particularly Luke and uh, Holly for. Uh, they've reached out to us, uh, recognizing that uh, research is particularly important in the energy transition. This is something looking even 10 years ago, certainly 20 years ago, there was little collaboration between industry and research institutions in energy sector. And, and uh, this is a recognition that things are different now. So uh, thank you, Luke and Holly and the Energy Efficiency Council. In th this year, th sorry, in this webinar, we will showcase cutting edge research on demand side flexibility from Australia and around the world. Um, it'll be a, a light handed, I would say, showcasing, leaving um, a lot of room for discussion and um, exploration of ideas in future directions. We'll run for about an hour and 20 minutes with um, uh, with 30 minutes of presentations and about 30 minutes of Q&A. So before I introduce my co-host, um, Director, or sorry, CEO of the Energy Efficiency Council, Luke Menzel, I would like to recognize that we're on the meeting on the traditional lands of the Kulin Nation. And I would like to pay respects to the Wurundjeri people who are the traditional custodians of this land from which I am speaking to you today. We pay respect to the elders past, present and emerging, and I extend this respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples in attendance today. And uh, look forward to welcoming more of them at various conferences around uh, that we will be hosting. So uh, thank you uh, for that first part. And it is now my pleasure to introduce Luke Menzel, CEO of the Energy Efficiency Council, which is a non-profit membership based organization for business, universities, government and non governmental organization. Luke is one of Australia's leading advocates for the role of energy efficiency, energy management and demand side response, sorry, demand response in Australia's energy transition. Thanks and welcome Luke and uh, over to you to uh, 
to actually run this webinar. Thank you. Hey, thanks, Ariel, and uh, thanks for the really warm introduction. And can I just say how thrilled we are to be partnering both with Monash Energy Institute, Monash University, of course, one of the EC's uh, valued university partners, as well as the Energy Research Institute's Council of Australia. We're massive fans of Erica at the Energy uh, Efficiency Council. Um, despite the fact that the policy signals have been pretty muddy over the last decade, the energy transition is uh, absolutely rocketing along here in Australia and it's throwing up novel challenges and opportunities right across the economy and getting our head around it all requires really strong connective tissue between industry and in universities and also government and we see Erica as a really exciting vehicle for that so we're delighted to be working with you on this event um, and today we're focusing on a, a topic that is uh, near and dear to my heart uh, flexible demand. Um, I've, I've said it before and I'll say it again, we're moving from a, a world um, where, uh, you know, we had these, these big generators, um, long transmission and distribution lines, and we had homes and offices and warehouses and factories, uh, mines and farms hanging off the end of the energy system to ones in which they, they are the energy system. And they aren't just generators they uh, they aren't just repositories for for solar pv um, they're repositories repositories of uh latent capacity potential flexible load that can help support ever high penetrations of renewables in our energy system ensure that cost of transition is low and can happen as quickly as possible now that's really easy for me to say, but there is a lot of work ahead for us to realise that potential and the role of researchers right around the world is absolutely critical to that. And it's a hot topic, not just here in Australia, but also you might be surprised to hear overseas. And um, that's and we're really lucky to have one of uh, the world's foremost experts in this topic uh, joining us from Denmark today. Uh, Rongling Lee is an Associate Professor at the Technical University of Denmark. She's a global expert on building energy flexibility and a co-lead of a five-year global international research collaboration on the topic of energy flexible buildings that sits under the International Energy Agency's Energy and Buildings and Communities Program, a program that uh, we have a close relationship with uh, here at the Energy Efficiency Council with experts from the IAEBC uh, joining us uh, for our conferences in, in 2016 and 2018. Now, um, Rongling is going to step us through some of those global drivers for research in this space and some of the insights that are emerging uh, from that work around the world. But Rongling, uh, uh, I've been advised that uh, it is part of my role as facilitator of this event to share a, a fun fact about uh, each of our participants. I think this is a this is a, a secret plan to keep our audience engaged in in uh, in what uh, Ariel described as uh, another uh, Zoom call, instigating Zoom fatigue amongst us all. And I understand uh, your fun fact is that you have climbed Australia's highest mountain. Is that correct? Yes, indeed. <laughs> and, and, and when were you in Australia? It was uh, in uh, February 2019. Oh, wow. So not that long ago at all. And uh, how, how taxing was that climb? Well, I think it was uh, very pleasant because uh, the pass was uh, yeah, pretty easy. <laughs> but it's, it's very scenic, really beautiful. Really beautiful part of the world. Well, uh, Rongling, I'll start. Uh, I'll start, stop asking you questions uh, out of your field of expertise. But we'd be delighted to hear your presentation if you're if you're ready to give it now. Thank you. Yes, thank you for the warm introduction. Thank you very much. Um, yes, I um, I am Rongling, uh, associate professor at uh, Technical University of Denmark, uh, very far away from Australia. And uh, from uh, this year, I also become operating agent for IAEBC NX82, which is uh, a uh, working group working on energy flexible buildings. So uh, today I'm going to introduce um, international programs, especially the European Commission's program, also the situation in Denmark. And then also give a very short uh, introduction to what we have done in Annex 67 and a, a short uh, introduction to uh, uh, our plan uh, in, uh, for Annex 82. Um, 
So uh, as Luke said, this is really a hot topic, uh, need a lot of research. And uh, in the Horizon 2020, the program run by EU uh, in the past 10 years, uh, this topic has been given a lot of funding. For example, uh, the last year, 2020, uh, there was a big call, Green Deal. And, uh, the aim is to uh, to help building and renovating buildings in Europe uh, to make it uh, uh, energy and resource efficient. And for that call, uh, the, it was uh, it has budget of 60 million euro, and uh, three projects were funded. And very fortunately, uh, my project is also funded. And um, for the next five years, um, then uh, there is a new European program called the Horizon Europe, uh, which will be running in the next seven years, and uh, with uh, uh, a big uh, budget as well. And uh, the objective of this program is uh, also to contribute to the sustainable development goals, and also the, the Paris Agreement. In this um, program, um, this, there are six clusters. Uh, cluster five is about climate, energy, and the mobility. Uh, the topic we are talking today is about energy demand and buildings energy flexibility that is within this cluster. So in the next seven uh, years, you can expect uh, a lot of projects in Europe on this topic. Um, looking into Denmark, uh, Denmark is a small country with only 5.7 million people. However, um, Denmark has very ambitious goals regarding um, sustainability development and uh, climate neutrality. Uh, already, uh, there was a goal of reaching 50% green power by 2020. Uh, I have to say this is uh, uh, achieved. And uh, by 2030, 100% of uh, green power, which means that all the electricity uh, uh, demand will be met by uh, green energy. And uh, by 2030, uh, we should have 70% greenhouse gas emission reduction in 90 level. And uh, by 2050, uh, the country should reach climate neutrality. Um, so this graph shows the wind power, uh, percentage of wind power in the Danish power grid. Uh, it has been increasing um, uh, over the year. And uh, last year in 2020, I believe uh, uh, there were um, uh, three or four days uh, because the weather condition was uh, so good for the wind turbine and uh, it 100% uh, of uh, the country's electricity demand was met by uh, uh, wind power generation. So which is sure that uh, we can do it. We have a, a technology, I can, we can manage it. Uh, but uh, that was just for a few days. Uh, for a long term, uh, we I, uh, still have challenge. Uh, for example, uh, what uh, what is the challenge we are uh, facing? Mm, the gray uh, the uh, the gray um, part shows the um, wind power generation, and uh, the red curve is the. Uh, electricity demand. Uh, um, you can see that uh, electricity demand uh, really has a, a pattern. It does not change much. Uh, however, the wind power generation really is affected by uh, the weather, how strong the wind is. So during the windy day, uh, there's a surplus uh, power generation. Uh, then we uh, need to uh, know who can consume more or store this energy. Then during some other calm days, um, there is not enough uh, when the power delivered to the grid, then what can we uh, do to, uh, to cope with this situation? So this is the need uh, why demand side management and the energy flexibility uh, should uh, come into play. 
Um, so uh, uh, here I have a short introduction about uh, uh, Annex 67, what we have done in Annex 67. Um, we proposed a flexibility index, uh, which is the reaction of a building or cluster of buildings to penalty signals. Uh, penalty signals could be a CO2 intensity. And control signals by the grid uh, or the price uh, uh, signal. Uh, uh, I believe our audience really know a lot about energy flexibility in buildings. Uh, uh, it is a very complex, um, uh, how to say, complex uh, system to study because it's uh, dynamic and uh, the capacity of energy flexibility really is influenced by uh, a few factors. For example, uh, the um, uh, thermal physics of the building, uh, what is the thermal mass, uh, thermal insulation in the building, and the uh, technologies that are available in the building, the installation of HVAC system, uh, heating system, and also users uh, influence how user use their system. Would you uh, do they like to open window a lot when they have a heating of uh, air conditioning on? Such uh, uh, also uh, smart control. Can do we have a, a good user friendly smart control for our users to actually provide the have the opportunity to provide the flexibility. So that's why it's a very complex um, uh, system to study. Uh, we proposed a, a relatively easy, simple methodology using flexibility in function and the index. What is it about? For example, um, this graph shows uh, flexibility function of three different buildings. Uh, building one, uh, this is about the thermal response of uh, buildings to penalty signal. Building one uh, has a large capacity of move uh, energy uh, demand. Uh, however, it responds to signal slowly. And on the other hand, building three responded to the signal very fast. However, the capacity of uh, moving uh, energy is uh, really small. And building two is uh, somehow in between. So building one is a typical building that is a heavy weight with a lot of thermal mass and uh, uh, also well insulated. A lot of uh, new buildings, uh, newly built buildings in Denmark is uh, this type of building. Uh, building three uh, is on the other end, uh, not much thermal mass uh, and uh, also not very well insulated. Um, when we, uh, we have this type of buildings, uh, how do they respond to the grid signal? Uh, this uh, shows uh, example of uh, three scenarios. Uh, um, with representing when the solar and the ramp problem uh, uh, issues uh, for wind. Uh, normally, uh, there are a few windy days followed by a few very calm days. Uh, so here the black line uh, shows that uh, we have 36 hours uh, with penalty signal zero, which means it's a, a very windy day and we have a lot of wind power production. And then followed by 36 hours of uh, uh, penalty uh, one, uh, which means uh, these are calm days with uh, very little wind production. And then the solar, we set the penalty uh, be uh, one during night and the zero at uh, during the daytime. Uh, assume that uh, those are very sunny days during the daytime. And the ramp is a very typical uh, situation happening in Norway uh, for the hydro power plant uh, power generation. 
uh, normally there are two uh, peak uh, demand in in the morning and in the evening. So each uh, uh, de peak uh, demand lasts two hours, and we have uh, 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 the the ramp for the ramp penalty. Uh, it, it's uh, one uh, during the morning peak hour and the evening peak hour. So with uh, this, uh, we uh, studied how this rebuildings react to such penalty signal. Uh, this is table shows the uh, result. Just to give examples, look at the 71% uh, for building three, uh, which means that um, the building three can actually save 71% of the pen ramp penalty uh, cost uh, if the building three uh, energy flexibility can be used for this purpose. So this is a very brief uh, uh, introduction to uh, one of the methodology we developed in Annex 67. Uh, continue Annex 67, we uh, prepared uh, a new Annex, which is 82. And during uh, the work in Annex 67, we uh, realized that uh, there are a lot of um, uh, problems and that need, still need to be studied further. Uh, the first is that the scale of um, um, buildings of is, is the key. Uh, you, you cannot uh, develop, uh, you cannot uh, really use uh, the energy flexibility from a single building uh, that much because the uncertainty is large. Uh, so we should aggregate energy flexibility from uh, a large number of buildings, um, which uh, is our subtask A for the new annex. And uh, uh, another uh, study uh, need to be done is that uh, it's very common for many countries and cities that building have uh, multi-carrier energy systems. For example, in Denmark, uh, the uh, heating and domestic hot water is supplied by uh, this heating system. Uh, so with uh, this multi-carry energy system, uh, there is more opportunity for energy flexibility in buildings. Uh, at the uh, same time, uh, it also provides resilience uh, in case of extreme uh, weather event. Um, so this is another topic uh, for sub B. And then, of course, uh, stakeholders. So uh, stakeholders, including uh, not only the users of a building, owners of a building, but also the grid operators and the uh, technology providers who provide a smart technology. Who, uh, so what, what, uh, what is the benefit and how do we engage them and make sure everybody can work together smoothly and uh, increase the end user's acceptance. Um, uh, then this uh, relates to another issue that is uh, that all the commercial stakeholders, what will be the new business model for them in order to implement uh, this uh, uh, solution for the future. So that's a subtask D. Um, <clears throat> and so far, this uh, uh, annex has uh, been uh, very uh, successful attracting um, participating participants. Uh, so far, we have uh, uh, 22 countries that uh, uh, attend, was attending preparation workshop and the workshops and uh, 15 countries already submitted their participation letter. Um, so uh, the preparation phase was uh, started in November 2019 and ended uh, June this year. So from June this year, we started the working phase. At the moment, we are uh, gathering experts working on uh, some um, uh, study on giving an overview of what's going on in this field uh, in order to plan our work for the next four years. So uh, this is the um, brief introduction about Annex 82. Uh, that is all from me for now. And I'm looking forward to discuss with you later. Thank you.
Hey, thank you so much, Rongling. What a what a comprehensive introduction to your work and the, the work of the IABC in this important topic of energy flexible buildings. I, I know that there will be folk that uh, want to learn more or uh, indeed want to uh, get involved with that global collaborative effort. Um, my colleague Kate, if she hasn't already done so, is about to um, drop some details in the chat. Uh, around how you can get involved uh, with Rongling's work um, and I'd encourage you to do so. That's um, some incredible and exciting research emerging from that space. Also know and I see there's already a few questions down in the Q&A tab. As we're moving our way through uh, these presentations, I'd encourage you to use that Q&A tab at the bottom of your screen. I'm going to be uh, uh, referring back to that when we get to the panel discussion section and, and trying to cover off as many of your questions as I can. So just uh, keep racking them up. So we're moving from uh, Denmark back to Australia now, and we're very lucky to have one of Australia's leading experts on this topic, Dr. Stephen White from CSIRO, another one of the Energy Efficiency Council's valued research partners to help us sort of get a bit of a sense of the strategic landscape and drivers here in Australia. Uh, Stephen, of course, has over 25 years of experience in energy efficiency and demand side management, leads CSIRO's energy efficiency research and he's involved with almost too many projects in this space for me to even mention there's the uh, the buildings to grid data clearinghouse that sits under the uh, the affordable heating and cooling innovation hub or iHub which our friends at era run um, you're the operating agent Stephen for another IABC annex annex 81 data driven smart buildings you're also a, a key player in in some of the early projects that have merged from the race for 2030 CRC. So I think we're incredibly uh, lucky to have you with us to uh, give us a sense of that strategic landscape, um, some of the drives and barriers across uh, Industry 4.0 data and digitalization. Um, uh, but when we asked you, Stephen, for your fun fact, your fun fact was that you don't have a fun fact and you're not very fun. Is Are you going to stick with that story? I'll stick with that story. I was almost going to uh, sort of say the, uh, the first few times that I met you, Luke, uh, and uh, my continued um, uh, so asking if you were from the Clean Energy Council or something <laughs> or other. <laughs> so, it, I can say it happens less and less as time goes yeah. on. And people trying to starting to work out the distinction between the supply side, the demand side, and the industry associations that that represent the various parts of the transition. Um, but uh, I will say it's it, it does occasionally happen that I get called Kane. <laughs> so move, move Never happen now. <laughs> All right, well, uh, Stephen, over to you. I'm uh, looking forward to your presentation. Beautiful. Thanks so much, uh, Luke, for the kind words. Beautiful. Yeah, so uh, just pulling together some slides uh, based on the work uh, of those uh, particular initiatives that uh, Luke actually mentioned. Uh, and I was asked to speak about uh, enabling uh, digitalization uh, and, uh, and data exchange. And so I'll try and stick to that topic. Uh, so, you know, Industry 4.0 and a danger of uh, sort of teaching everyone to uh, suck eggs there. Um, I like that definition there that it is informed yet autonomous uh, decisions. So let's be clear, this is about getting the machines to do things for us to take the labour costs out. But at the same time, it is essential that it is informed by human uh, intervention. So, uh, you know, what is Industry 4.0? Breaking it down into some elements. This is some work that uh, CSIRO did. Uh, put it into four different things. And I like to think of the top two quadrants there as sort of relating to almost like a, a jigsaw. That is the jigsaw pieces are the bits of data that we capture, but by themselves scattered in a box, they're not actually uh, very uh, understandable. And so there is this big job of assembling the data into a form that makes sense. And that means positioning data with other data. And that's a big data management task, which is often uh, overlooked. Once we have data and we've got it structured up, then we can actually do the funky stuff, the artificial intelligence and the like. And then of course, we wanna take something um, from that and actually do something with it. Uh, and so that data to decision-making is uh, the important bit. And there's a whole bunch of innovations across each of those four elements uh, that have uh, come upon us. Uh, Internet of Things um, is one that I think um, possibly is a bit overused as a phrase, but to me, the real 
secret source of the Internet of Things is the ability to get around uh, firewalls and uh, and things by direct uh, from device to the cloud and not having to use um, the uh, uh, enterprise uh, IT system. Uh, geospatial uh, and particularly sort of address matching and stuff uh, enables data to be assembled and for insights to be obtained. So there's a bunch of things there that have developed uh, recently that uh, make data capture so much more than it ever was. As I said, in the data management space, data federation uh, is core. And I guess structuring up that data with what I'm calling there the semantic data models so that when the data is in a database, you can query it from all sorts of different uh, approaches and uh, you can find the relationships between the data and the relationships or the metadata uh, is ever so critical. Uh, another aspect there, and this comes down then to managing the ethics of the uh, data, is providing security. That is, that the data owner is able to share data uh, to the people that should have the data and keep it from those that shouldn't. So access controls is crucial to that data management space. Uh, as I mentioned, once you've got the data uh, and structured it up, you can uh, you apply artificial intelligence, machine learning and the like to get insights that you would not otherwise have got. And then the decision and action uh, phase there, really it is about the machines then using the business rules that are provided to it to automate the dispatch uh, and financial settlement uh, of uh, whatever the activity is. Uh, and at all times, keeping humans informed so that they can actually intervene if they um, so feel like it and certainly to understand what's going on. So what are you left with when you actually bring all of these elements together? You typically end up with matchmaking platforms. Uh, and the matchmaking platforms there, uh, they streamline the processes for setup, dispatch, and settlement uh, there. And so something like Uber or Airbnb is a classic sort of uh, platform that that enable, provides the interfaces for humans to interact, but streamlines and automates all the processes that are underneath that. And uh, you know, the license to operate is based on the quality of the information and the transparency of the information that you uh, provide. If you get it right, then you lower transaction costs and you apply scalable business models. So that's kind of the technology side of it. But then, well, you know, what are the problems that you would actually be trying to solve for in flexible demand? Uh, and so in the race for 2030, um, we did an opportunity assessment. Uh, and one of the core parcels of work there was to understand the barriers to flexible demand. So we did nine interviews, three round tables with energy users. And we have very much had an energy user focus there uh, to understand the barriers for people who could provide flexible demand, um, particularly in the commercial and industrial sectors. We did a big literature review uh, of what is uh, the international um, uh, audiences found. Uh, and we ran a workshop with over 40 participants uh, with a, the entire range of uh, stakeholders present from buyers mm. of flexible demand to sellers to policymakers and technology providers. And so with the barriers, we divided into this quadrant diagram, one around the economics incentives is one around the cultural and behavioral factors, particularly of uh, energy users, and then the technologies to implement, uh, and then the range of other factors, particularly relating to sort of the processes of um, uh, registering equipment and, uh, and making things happen. Uh, but ultimately, it boiled down to kind of two key things when you sort of helicoptered up. One was that really, guys, is there much money in this for, from an energy user perspective and gosh there's a hell of a lot of uncertainty in how I actually get to uh, to receive my payday uh, and then that sort of reflected then on a bunch of a whole bunch of end user engagement issues you know why is this my problem go sort it please supply industry I cannot or do not want to change the way I do anything uh, really and very much a risk lens being applied um, you know, some of the key issues there around sort of price signaling when you actually smush um, into retail tariffs uh, that might have a really light 
temporal dimension, that's time of use tariffs, but no locational dimension. You know, ultimately you end up with pretty blunt um, prices that don't really create much incentive. And even if you go for spot market exposure, uh, you know, you might have a four year, uh, sorry, four hour um, window to implement flexible demand by which time suddenly the market has changed and the, um, and the prices change substantially. Uh, and so on the whole, the complexity of all of that uh, was not uh, high good for uh, for end users. There were uh, some sectors that had um, uh, sort of inherent storage capability. So for example, water pumping uh, and the like, and refrigeration, cold storage, uh, and certainly um, entity people had um, standby generators. Uh, and so they were starting to do stuff uh, and had an appetite for more, but the vast majority were not keen to uh, get involved. Technology was, um, was generally deemed to not be a problem, but it would be fair to say that the majority of people we talked to uh, really hadn't even got to that point of considering the technology because they were still back at the first uh, hurdle, if you like, which is, is there a strategic business case for me? So some of the issues were clearly around strategic issues to overcome around the market um, uh, for this product um, and requires reform uh, in the um, in the sector, uh, but some of it was um, was very nuts and bolts operational. And so I guess the question then is, what is it that the um, that industry 4.0 could uh, do here? Is it just a matter of battling it out uh, step by step through the uh, ESB or uh, other reform uh, process? Or, or is there something that um, that is new that makes flexible demand more possible now than it ever was before? And I would argue, and I've given a whole uh, raft of different um, opportunities there where industry 4.0 does make a difference. If you have industry 4.0, you can get down to quite granular dispatch based on spot price, demand history or location. You can actually start to think about value stacking, network value and wholesale market value. You can actually think about alternative ways of uh, confirming that you have actually delivered your um, uh, flexible demand without necessarily having to uh, use billing meters. And there was a really lovely discussion on uh, the cost of billing meters and the usefulness uh, of them. There's a huge amount to do with uh, the purchasing and providing consumer data right to enable people to use their data and to, through transparent markets, access alternative providers. And with the wholesale demand response mechanism coming up, the opportunities there may be a whole lot more. Or even in the skills space, to actually be able to centralize data in the one place so that you can uh, get the best experts into the analysis and then provide recommendations rather than requiring all the expertise to be at every single energy end user seems a whole lot more realistic. And in some ways, that's what aggregators would be uh, chasing. Uh, so huge number of um, things, and they are not just technology solutions. They're significantly about markets and, uh, and business models. So in the uh, iHub, uh, we have particularly um, have been focusing on one sector, that's the commercial building sector. And whereas batteries and electric vehicles and things have got significant hardware costs, the HVAC sector in the commercial buildings, essentially the kit's already there. Uh, and so from a CapEx point of view, this should be really low hanging fruit, flexible demand. And so the issues are more around industry alignment and transaction cost, and that says industry 4.0 is the thing that would unlock what, uh, what Danny would call homogeneous, ubiquitous and feasible, flexible demand. But by the way, you know, ultimately, if you're targeting a particular sector, to ask them to be energy market specialists is, uh, is crazy. And so there is this sort of alignment of interests. And if you're going to go into the commercial buildings industry, you need to consider to, that you're part of a, an industry 4.0 ecosystem that's called PropTech. Uh, and the value actually is in the richness of the discussion. 
Uh, we've looked at sort of where the cost structures are uh, for providing flexible demand in the commercial building sector and divided it up in three different areas from cloud hosting uh, and platform operations. The value sits in the application that's provided, but a good chunk of the cost actually sits down around the uh, infrastructure there. So in the uh, iHub there, we've actually proposed that what is required is, is the, in fact that data infrastructure, almost like the poles and wires for our electricity industry, which is the part in that top right hand quadrant there of the earlier diagram, which is to get real time data out of the building, federate it with other data, make it interoperable and put it into structured formats so that people can do bring their smarts uh, to the um, uh, to this, uh, provide value-added solutions. We've built our uh, infrastructure. We've got uh, 25 odd buildings contracted to be on that data clearinghouse representing building typologies. We've got a, a machine learning baselining uh, app for uh, to enable flexible demand um, to be baselined and uh, to work out um, how much is, uh, energy is saved. And in the race for 2030 um, work that we did, we actually started to look at, well, if we had a target of one gigawatt of flexible demand, which we believe is available uh, really quite easily, what would that be worth as the last gigawatt of capacity in the electricity system? And you know, with our back of the envelope uh, calculations, around $455 million per year worth of savings. And even if you had relatively expensive flexible demand at $155 per kVA per year, that would be $300 million per year of bill savings for electricity consumers. So definitely well worth considering how the Internet of Things can unlock substantial value in the electricity industry. Thanks, Luke. No, thanks you. Thank you, Stephen. Um, again, like a, just a, a presentation that speaks to the to the breadth of your engagement in this space and the and the range of opportunities that researchers have uh, to uh, to really pin down what some of these opportunities uh, uh, look like and, and really solve some of those near-term problems that we have in terms of engaging engaging with customers. Um, uh, we'll circle back to you, Stephen, on that topic uh, in the panel discussion, but for the moment, it uh, falls to me to round out uh, my introductions with another leading local expert. Uh, Danny Alexander is research principal at the UTS Institute for Sustainable Futures, another one of the Energy Efficiency Council's valued university partners. And Danny specialises in understanding game-changing technologies with a focus on distributed energy resources to promote energy system flexibility. And over the last year, Danny has also taken up the role of Race for Business program leader at the newly established Reliable, Affordable, Clean Energy for 2030, our Race for 2030 Cooperative Research Centre, which has the vision of a customer-centred clean energy transition. And Danny, I understand you're going to give us a sense of what's been happening in that big new CRC, which has just completed its first year and um, has spent a lot of that time doing the, the mapping that will drive the research priorities over the next decade. But before I let you do that, I do have to share your fun fact, which um, is is pretty on point. It's sports related in this, uh, this uh, uh, Olympic fortnight. Um, I'm not sure, is, is ultimate Frisbee an Olympic sport, Danny, yet? Is, or is that something that we're uh, looking forward to in the future? Uh, mm -hmm. I, I ask the question because you, are, you have, have, of course, uh, represented Australia as an ultimate Frisbee champion. <laughs> uh, uh, yes, unfortunately, we've not yet been successful to make it into the Olympics, but we do compete at the World Games, uh, which is uh, which is the tournament that is for all those sports that are still vying to get into the Olympic Channel, but it is lovely to be able to see them playing at the moment. It gives us a bit of hope for us to be able to compete internationally again as well. Indeed. And uh, look, uh, we haven't heard Ariel's fun fact yet, but I'm going to give you uh, the early lead for the fun fact of all of the panellists that I'm introducing today. So, so stay, stay tuned for the, that um, uh, virtual gold medal I'll be handing out shortly. But for the moment, Danny, um, over to you for your presentation. <laughs> Thank you very much. So, so I am calling in from Ashfield in Sydney today. So I would also just like to, before starting, acknowledge the Wangal people of the Eora Nation and pay my respects to the elders past and present. I, uh, as Ariel mentioned at the beginning of this session, wear a couple of hats 
Uh, as Luke mentioned, I'm the Race for Business program leader, uh, as well as the research principal uh, at UTS Institute for Sustainable Futures. So today, I think um, you've heard a little bit uh, of the work that Stephen has been doing for us at Race for 2030. So I thought it might be useful for me to give, a, give you a sense of what Race for 2030 is. Uh, Luke, thank you for elaborating on the acronym. You've done a little bit of my work for me. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about race for business, business in particular, as well as the theme that we're talking about uh, today around flexible demand and demand control and how we're planning to fund research in this space over the next 10 years. So uh, reliable, affordable, clean energy is the remit for Race for 2030. We, uh, we have a big vision, which is a flourishing low carbon Australia where energy research improves quality of life and boosts energy productivity. So no mean feat, but we do have 10 years and $350 million to do it uh, with our mission being to drive innovation for a secure, affordable, clean energy future. So uh, under this, Cooperative Research Centre, we have four programs. As I mentioned, I'm Race for Business. Uh, Ariel is Race for Networks, and we have two other programs, Race for Homes and Race for Everyone. Uh, there are 17 research themes underneath that. Uh, so instead of presenting each of them, I thought I would present you the partners that we have in our team of Race for 2030. And they are substantial and very, very exciting to work with because they're driving research impact in this space. So we have a number of networks and retailers, technology providers, and our key research institutes and education institutions as well, both in Australia as well as internationally as well. So we're all working together. We've been together for about a year now. Uh, uh, framing up the programs and the themes within them together and we're now looking forward to investing in exciting new research projects. Uh, Race for Business in particular, I will just give you the quick headline blurb that we are about boosting as, uh, Australian business energy productivity and, and that is really through digitalization as Stephen has talked a little bit about, uh, electrification and value chain transformation. Uh, but our fourth research theme is specifically talking to flexible demand and demand control. And I know that's why you are all here today. So I thought I would just hone in on that, but happy to talk about some of the other work that we do, if that's interesting. Notably, uh, we also have another research theme on Industry 4.0 for energy productivity, which of course is relevant to what Stephen was talking to as well. So narrowing the focus again, otherwise I'll keep you well beyond five. Uh, is flexible demand and demand control. And what we're really looking at here, the key research question um, that can be also framed as an industry problem is how can Australian businesses maximize the benefits of load flexibility? And really that's, that's really important to us because uh, as uh, I, I think was mentioned earlier, while cooperative research centers are about um, industry led research, Race for 2030 is also about customer focused research. So this perspective of Australian businesses is really important. The hypothesis being it's a win-win-win. You'll be able to benefit as a business uh, and the network will uh, also be able to benefit due to less investment uh, from flexible demand uh, and will also be able to fit more renewables on the grid. So, so we've been investigating this uh, over the last six months with the team at CSIRO, but also researchers at UTS and RMIT uh, with a number of industry partners, including the Energy Efficiency Council who led the industry reference group, which was, uh, which was a great resource uh, and, and fostered vibrant discussion on this topic. Under the, um, uh, under the broad actually scope, if we narrowed it down to Australian businesses, so commercial and industrial customers, we actually left the flexibility side a little bit broader. So we looked and I've, I've borrowed, uh, appreciatively borrowed uh, a diagram here from the folks at Lawrence Berkeley National Laboratory, uh, which you would have also seen maybe mentioned in one of Stephen's slides, uh, because we framed our, the idea of flexible demand in terms of these uh, four types of flexible demand, which were shape, shift, shed and shimmy. And I saw a question in, uh, in the chat about 
um, different network services that perhaps relate to that shimmy um, uh, right angle triangle there around that duration, uh, but it's also about what those services can provide. So that gives you maybe a little bit of a context around you know, what we're aiming towards or what our, our hypothesis is. I would just say what I'd just like to also touch on why this is really important to us at base is because we really see flexible demand being able to meet um, the racking race, really supporting our impact goals around reliability. So support these services, helping electricity become more reliable, but also more affordable and also cleaner. So again, it goes to that um, that win, win, win. Um, so I mentioned this opportunity assessment, the last six months of work that we have done scoping out opportunities in the space of flexible demand and demand control. Uh, and, and really this is, uh, this is borrowed from the, uh, the research team that developed this framework for us to consider how to best invest the budget that we have at Race for 2030 into really impactful research uh, on flexible demand and demand control. So really here on the right hand side, you'll see that there's a diagram here that I think really neatly summarizes the complexity of this uh, of flexible demand. And I think Rongling also touched on this is that we're talking about uh, integrating flexible demand buyers and sellers. So uh, which, which of course is not how the system has been run for some uh, from a, a traditional point of view in that now suddenly your prosumers or your customers or your um, flexible demand sellers will be will be actively engaged in the market and then there's a role for policy uh, makers and regulators as well as technology and service providers there too but really what what it came down to what it boiled down to is that we're keen to invest in research that is going to make a difference to customers so really that that was summarized under three things is uh, how do we make flexible demand easier and more trustworthy and make it relevant for the businesses who could provide that flexible demand, as well as making it financially visible and viable. So I think that just um, goes to what Stephen was saying earlier as well uh, about being able to de-risk the investments that would unlock that flexible demand and then being able to unlock that flexible demand when we need it as well. So there, there is a very long report and a lot of resources that will be published in the next a uh, couple of months that we hope, but really I just thought I would give you a taster of what we're, what we're planning to invest in, which really are around um, uh, three streams of work. The first of which are around strategic solutions to particular barriers, particularly uh, pricing. And so we're, we're looking to invest in um, uh, particularly uh, how better pricing, and that includes network and res uh, retail pricing can better support unlocking um, flexible demand, as well as foc focusing on some particular sectors that have transformative potential. So um, going back to that large goal of rate, race for business of uh, looking at transformative potential, uh, we identified uh, commercial buildings, water, including agriculture and food and beverage manufacturing as some really uh, prospective sectors to invest in. Uh, in terms of flexible demand. And finally, we have a number of industry partners involved that have a high interest in this space. In fact, uh, I often um, uh, go back to our original survey about industry partners and this particular theme of the 17 rate, uh, rated highest on the agenda for those industry partners. So we are also seeking to enable our industry partners to to, to progress their, their business as well uh, in the way that it can unlock flexible demand. So uh, I'm not sure if I've uh, used my time, but I think that's, that's me for the moment. I have more to say, of course, but I, I understand we're getting close to five. So I thought I would leave it there and please reach out to me as well. These are my details at Race for 2030 if you would like to get in contact. Hey, thanks, Danny. I think that has probably whetted everybody's appetite um, for for both the work of, of race, if they weren't already aware of it, but uh, also 
the discussion we're about to embark on. Um, I'd like to invite all of our uh, panelists uh, to join me and Danny on the screen. So Stephen, Rongling, and Ariel is coming back at the end of the session. And uh, Ariel, uh, uh, I, I want to get your reflections on uh, these three fabulous presentations we've just been listening to. But before I do that, um, uh, it is incumbent on me uh, to uh, uh, flag your fun fact. Um, we could just come out with it, but uh, when you shared it with us before the session started, you you posed it as a bit of a brain teaser. And so I, I was thinking, well, why don't you do that for our audience, and then they can uh, they can mull over that and, and drop their responses in the, the chat, and we can we can see who comes up with the correct answer uh, first between now and uh, when we're wrapping up at uh, five twenty five AEST. Uh, does that sound reasonable? No worries. Yeah. So uh, my fun fact is uh, I was born in a country that no longer exists. So you have right. to guess um, what that is. So um, if we don't get it in the next five or 10 minutes, um, I think there's a clue <laughs> that we can share. Um, but uh, in the meantime, uh, Ariel, uh, what occurred to you as you were listening to uh, Rongling, uh, uh, Stephen and Danny? What, what, what are your reflections? So Look, uh, what, what occurs to me, first of all, is, is that uh, there's, there's a lot of work already going on in this space. That's, that's mm -hmm. great. And uh, I think it's, some of it is quite advanced, a lot of good thinking. Um, that also occurs to me that it's a really challenging problem. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's, in a sense, it's a problem because it's a big opportunity. Right? We could just say, well, we won't worry about this demand flexibility. We will just build out the, um, the grid and the uh, invest in more um, uh, storage and other um, and you know large amounts of uh, like centralized renewables or we can say well what's the most efficient um, mix of demand side and uh, centralized responses and um, and so, so this is what makes this problem quite uh, important and interesting uh, and uh, I guess my my big question uh, around a lot of these sort of things is um, this applies to a lot of the things people talk about in in the uh, uh, in Australia, calling it yeah, DR orchestration and and so forth. And then I think Stephen alluded um, to this a little bit about that stack and the cost is in the uh, enablement st stack. And uh, I'm saying let, uh, like, let's not over underestimate how difficult that is. Um, even as something as simple as a retail billing system, we've seen a few. Chief information officers get fired because they get over budget, and this is like a couple of orders of magnitude more difficult. Not only you've got to connect all these devices, and we're talking about millions of um, uh, you know control points or decision variables, and and then you've got to work out which one to should do what at every point in time over a certain horizon. It's a complex uh, optimization problem. So how do we? Um, uh, you know, how do we do that? that? That's where I think the challenge and the R and D is that, that uh, I see has been quite interesting. So that that that's really, and that's from a from a research uh, applied research perspective. I think that's very exciting and important. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I'm I'm keen to get Stephen's reflections on that. But it also strikes me that there's quite it's it, it's not a generic problem either across different sectors of the economy. Um, you've got different loads. You've got different different businesses with different levels of sophistication um, that can potentially play very different roles. And then you've got the whole, uh, you know, we don't have a representative of the Race for Homes uh, research stream with us today. But um, there's a there's a whole another set of uh, opportunities and challenges in the residential space. And so we need to actually get quite granular in our thinking, right, Ariel, um, around how we how we address all that. But Stephen, um, did you have a reaction to Ariel's comments? Yeah, no, it's a good one. Um, so I was at a uh, presentation uh, by the uh, NREL vice president, and uh, he said that uh, he wondered what the energy system of the future was in terms of the number of devices that would be interacting. Was it a 10 to the 3, a 10 to the 6, a 10 to the 9, or a 10 to the 12? You know, um, it's all you academics out there that like your scientific uh, numerology kind of thing. Uh, you know, just the sheer a scale of what's interacting, I guess, is um, uh, is something that we don't know yet. Uh, and do you go for silver bullets, you know, build a hyd hyd snowy hydro 2.0, or do you actually take this low cost but but difficult to engage um, stuff that's out there called flexible demand? 
Yeah, and I suppose we have a sort of a bit of a view um, at the Energy Efficiency Council that you you need to ac activate as much of that um, latent capacity as is as accessible, and we won't know how much of it is accessible until we try. Um, but by doing so, even a little bit, um, if you uh, when you think about something like peak demand, even activating a little bit and reducing some of those peaks can be, can can result in billions and billions of dollars less on supply side infrastructure, which means we can get through this transition quicker and cheaper. And so it's something something that we need to try. Um, uh, Rongling, do you have any reflections on you know that 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 issue of the you know huge opportunity, difficult to engage? Is that something you're grappling with overseas as well? Yeah, exactly. This is also our experience in uh, having been working on several projects and continuously working on this. Uh, but uh, I, I think we do feel that we, this is a big puzzle. We have to solve it uh, uh, one piece, uh, one uh, step. Mm -hmm. So for example, in our uh, project we just finished for, uh, in the last five years, um, we demonstrated uh, a few potential uh, technologies and uh, such as uh, how to we eliminate uh, the supply water temperature from district heating to the buildings and uh, we developed some uh, quite smart uh, very effect effective control and just uh, the uh, what what is the cost is to add the two more temperature sensor in the water storage tank so uh, this is actually implemented by the manufacturer which is the Force, which is uh, really big in Denmark, also Europe provide the uh, heating uh, solutions. So now this has become uh, their product. So I, uh, this is an example that uh, how can we uh, solve this puzzle? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a really good point. Um, and uh, uh, Danny, uh, what, are, what are your early intuitions about how when we when we think about businesses in particular, um, Stephen making some some comments around there about some of the some of the barriers <laughs> that they're facing. What's your early intuition about how you know race and I guess industry and government can overcome some of those barriers to access some of that latent capacity in Australia? Yeah, and I think uh, maybe to put a positive spin on it, where what we've been doing uh, and maybe what has been recommended as well for us to focus on a positive case studies. Where, where folks are already doing this well and could be expanded. And uh, when I say expanded, I mean replicated in other businesses uh, as well as expanded even in the business itself. And so uh, what I would say there is in terms of um, what we've heard from businesses is that case studies that can help de-risk that decision for them are very useful, but those case studies need to provide the right type of in information so yeah. that it actually de-risks it. But what we are seeing already is that through mechanisms that exist at the moment, so for instance, the RERT scheme that, that was presented, but also with businesses that are engaging with other energy products like renewable power purchase agreements, for instance, those businesses are starting their energy journey and they're able to actually unlock a lot of flexible demand uh, as they become more, um, I guess, aware of the, op the the latent opportunity that exists there, I think is maybe just to borrow your term there. It's a, it's a really good point. And um, there's a couple of things there. There's the, there's the relatability of the case study, something which a case study that's coming from a peer uh, in one's sector is so much more powerful than something from another sector of the economy, even if it's, if it's local. It's also the level of detail. So having a one page, a glossy eye, oh, isn't, isn't it all fabulous? Like that's, that's enough to kind of start the conversation. But um, for someone that's trying to think, okay, well, what does this mean? And how would I operationalize such an opportunity? Um, you need that level of granular detail and that knowledge sharing and that happening quite, quite rapidly. Um, the other thing that occurs to me, and I sort of, you know, it's it's a little bit sad, but I'm I'm not going to give up this uh, this anecdote because uh, it's really stuck with me. The late and great Chloe Munro, um, when she was sort of supporting some of our early thinking around business engagement, she she said to me, "Luke, it's actually pretty simple around how you create how you engage businesses. Um, you create some FOMO." <laughs> Some fear of missing out. You sense that the, uh, the that the you know your competitor is stealing a march on you, and they're on top of a technology or a solution or a way of saving money or making money that is is something that we're not we're we're, we're not across. That is an that's an incredible motivator for businesses. So the degree that we can 
harness that, um, you know, I think we'll be in, we'll be in good shape. Uh, does anyone else want to comment on that particular topic or shall I dive into the questions that are in the Q and A? We've got a few questions here that have, and both in the comments in the chat, Rong Ling about the situation in Denmark. Um, they're noting that there's, uh, you've, you've got some hydro capacity there. They're wondering about the capacity of hydro to ramp up um, to cover um, peaks, uh, system peaks. Um, so that almost, uh, the, you know, the, the, the dispatchability of that, that hydro to meet the, the, the demand. And then, you know, what the various resources, I suppose, that you have available there in Denmark and, and what, the, what the particular challenges are that um, uh, demand side resources and, and things like demand response can, can play in supporting the broader system. <clears throat> I have to clarify that what I talked about uh, hydro in my presentation is uh, the Norwegian case. So in okay. Denmark, the tallest mountain is 200 meters. Right. As that you can sense. see, there is no hydro. <laughs> yeah, so uh, because uh, the Nordic countries, uh, also uh, West Europe country like France, um, UK, also Czech Republic in the center of Europe, 16 countries are actually connected uh, in the Nord Pool, so-called the Nord Pool is a market for trading electricity. So uh, in this sense, when we look at this larger scale, it makes sense to, to say what resource do we have uh, for this uh, electricity market in the large um, area of Europe. So this is not only about Denmark. Mm. Uh, about Denmark, uh, the, uh, the future plan would probably, when the power generation will be 90 to 95% of all green energy. That is the plan for Denmark. Right, um, no, that, that's, really, that's really helpful and provides that international context. Um, I'm being reminded to uh, pay attention to which questions have been upvoted in the chat. And so I'm going to go to the top question now, um, which is around um, the role of flexibility as it relates to networks, which I think in Australia is, a, is, a, is an emerging area. It's one that's on the radar, but uh, there hasn't been as much work done. But obviously, there's a, there's a lot of engagement um, from networks, particularly in the race for 2030. Um, and we've got a question here um, around the role of flexibility in system strengths and inertia, but also around um, uh, networks, um, just distributors and transmission, transmission networks. And I suppose there's an element there about a, a avoided network augmentation that can be, um, uh, can be uh, enabled through uh, flexibility, through and, you know, energy efficiency, energy management, the like. Does anyone want to comment on, on that area and, and where the conversation might be going here in Australia? I can see Stephen putting his hand up. Um, so, uh, you know, in one of the conversations uh, through the race CRC, uh, one of the issues was actually minimum demand and minimum demand being one of the uh, issues that sort of sparks some of this inertia issue for the uh, for the networks. That is, they haven't got enough demand going through to be able to keep the um, uh, the rolling reserve sort of up or something like that. I'm no electrical engineer. And, you know, to what extent would flexible demand be able to provide uh, uh, a response to minimum demand um, is a new challenge that hasn't been there before uh, in our industry. And so that's certainly one that uh, I'm sure race will be, um, will be chasing after. But in our uh, opportunity assessment, uh, you know, we sort of looked at hot water systems there. And, uh, you know, hot water systems as a um, sort of a load that's um, weighted across uh, the entire day. Uh, if you could actually concentrate that hot water demand into a relatively narrow window of time, there's crazy amounts of minimum demand that you can actually provide, you know, something in the order of five gigawatts. Uh, there was our um, sort of initial assessment uh, of that. Um, you know, there were issues there, you know, if you return to service uh, of hot water systems, you know, suddenly they're, uh, they're all on and then suddenly they're all off. That causes its own pain and stuff. But, uh, but yes, flexible demand um, is a real opportunity for uh, helping out with, uh, with system strength and uh, energy inertia issues and, and minimum demand is one of the interesting angles uh, on that providing inertia, helping to provide inertia. Ariel, I imagine you want to weigh in on that, that network question. I know it's a topic that's close to your heart. 
Um, so I wanted to just clarify a point that may be a little bit of uh, confusion around system strength. Um, system strength is a voltage issue, not a um, frequency issue. That's primarily the definition. You know, sometimes you can combine them. So, so using demand flexibility to provide support system strength is a fraught thing. You, you really got to bring in smart inverters and other devices. So I just wanted to mention that, uh, that, that this is a, an issue to keep an eye on. But also, yeah, th there is opportunities to do that, but that, that's not, you can't do it off the shelf in as, much, as well as you could with um, uh, managing uh, uh, yeah, frequency and, and so forth. Uh, so I don't know, Stephen, you, you didn't look so sure about my uh, definition, so you, you're welcome to contradict me. Too expressive face. <laughs> uh, I was picking on the inertia uh, bit there, um, but certainly, yeah, voltage is something that, um, uh, that could be managed, uh, I guess, through um, uh, increasing or, or reducing uh, demand as well, to some extent, yeah. All right, we've got a question, uh, Stephen, I'm just around wanting to uh, uh, get you to share your work around quantifying the benefit of, of demand management that you referenced in your presentation. Is that publicly available? Uh, so the um, final report will be made available um mm -hmm. and uh and so people will have uh, access to that to be clear this was an opportunity assessment and so more of a scoping study so this mm -hmm. was not a deep dive uh, assessment there but the results that uh, we came up with our um our analysis were actually very conservative compared with uh, other estimates were that were out there so there's a lovely one which is the us uh, department of energy roadmap around grid enabled buildings and you know just scaling the results of that said that it would be worth something like $790 million per year in terms of um, customer uh, bill savings. We only got $300 million. Uh, and ARENA has been doing a, uh, a study as well, and that came up with uh, with larger numbers again. Um, so, you know, we would see ourselves as conservatively coming up with, uh, with numbers, but we haven't used sort of the Plexos modeling and the more complicated techniques that you'd expect in a full-blown research study on the, on the topic. But happy to share what we have done. Yeah, excellent. Um, we've got any, we're getting questions in, into us via email, which is very exciting. I'm not sure where the email's coming from, but uh, we've got one for you, Rong Ling, which is uh, what percentage of EU demand was the Danish wind generation on the day that it exceeded demand? Sorry, again, I could not, I cannot see the question. Uh, I can, what percentage of the whole EU's demand, if I, I may have mistyped it? uh um was that because you know denmark this was i don't think uh ross baldick minds me mentioning him i don't know maybe you it was uh, on uh, audio only or something but i don't know how he sent me an email then anyway so <laughs> um uh, yeah so what percentage of total eu demand was that um uh, production on the day that wind production exceeded denmark demand so I guess it's more or less what percentage of EU demand is Danish demand. I, you know, so he's being a little bit provocative there, which is good. Uh, in terms of uh, the, the total electricity demand of EU yeah, yeah. So you compared to the... Denmark, I uh, I have to check it. I don't have the number in my mind. Yeah, <laughs> uh, that wouldn't be obvious. Yes. <laughs> sure enough, I'm taking it on notice. Um, all right. Uh, now, um, Ariel, do you have your you have your hand up? Did you want to? I know that was that was before from before. Sorry. And you've noted here that the race for the CRC is about funded project around shifting hot water into solar peak time. Yeah, we're working on it. I should have said we're working on developing one with a with a very um, you know, well progressed partner in that. So we're we're on the ball. We're we're on it. <laughs> Now there's a question here uh, from Robert. Um, I'm not sure if our panelists can see it uh, around uh, the, in lieu of penalty and system imposed signals would not markets provide a more optimal solution. Um, I think Robert, and I'm just scanning the question here is talking about relying on supply side markets. Um, is, that, is that your reading of it, Stephen? Uh, so a penalty signal uh, would typically be used um, 
is just another name in some ways for a price. I mean, a price can be a penalty. So uh, I don't see that they're necessarily uh, diametrically opposed. Um, so, I mean, the interesting thing uh, for us is, you know, we considered energy users. They looked at uh, the markets, the electricity markets, so wholesale markets. Is there a network market, perhaps? highly opaque uh, and stuff. So you'd want to have a good market, but ultimately energy consumers don't want to sort of understand the intricacies of the electricity market particularly. Uh, and so what we toyed with, and I'm not sure whether it was necessarily a firm recommendation, but you know, can you have something that looks a bit more like a feed-in tariff for flexible demand? Because ultimately that is simple, easy to understand, gives you a chance to say, uh, to make a judgment as an energy user who's not a market expert as to whether you're going to invest in providing flexible demand. So I think we, um, people generally supported the idea of, uh, of markets uh, and stuff, but uh, to have structures that were um, uh, simpler was seen deemed to be really important from an end user, end user perspective. Yeah, look, um, we, uh, we found that same uh, thing in and our engagement with end users. We had a, a session on this broad topic at our um, National Energy Efficiency Conference last year and had the head of sustainability from Charter Hall, one of the big property groups. And, and you know, the property sector in Australia, and it's interesting, you know, we're spending quite a lot of time talking about buildings. Um, often we, and when we're talking about energy flexibility, it's the industrial loads, which are more accessible and, 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 and more prone to, prone to participate. But um, the commercial building sector, those large property groups are incredibly sophisticated um, relative to some other parts of the economy have a really good handle over their energy use. But even there, she was saying, look, this needs to be really easy for us because as you say, Stephen, we do not want to become energy market experts. We're just not interested. <laughs> we're happy to participate and we're happy if there's a value proposition there. But it, the, the word she used was turnkey solution. They kind of want the, they, they want the complexity, complexity of it had handled, hand, handled elsewhere. And another kind of part of it was that flexible demand wasn't really a drop-in replacement for generation or a drop-in replacement for poles and wires. It has its own distinct characteristics in terms of how long you've got in terms of notice periods uh, and, the, and the like. And so to squeeze it in as though it were generation into uh, one particular slice of the market is, uh, is to miss out on some of the opportunity that flexible demand uh, provides across a range of um, of different parts of the electricity supply industry. And so what we did talk a lot about was the need to be able to bundle value from all the different components of the um, electricity industry. And so, you know, I mean, how much, uh, how likely are we to get that through the reform process? Um, yeah. Okay, I should note um, that uh, I think we've had a, a few participants uh, uh, address your brain teaser, Ariel. I think we have a winner. Did you want to reveal what the uh, what the answer was, just so that we put people out of their misery? Well, so there's two winners, although one of them I think might have cheated uh, because I think they knew. Also, oh, three winners maybe. Um, we have uh, I work backwards. Uh, Zara Rahimpour, it's USSR. And uh, that's the answer. And there was also um, Patrick Riakos and Gabby Satori. And uh, I don't think uh, anybody else guessed it. There was right. some close, you know, Eastern Bloc was clearly. Um, but I, I like the, there was a flurry of Rhodesia. Apparently, I have a slightly a South African accent, which puts a few people on the wrong track. I've never been in Africa, let alone South Africa. So um, that's. Uh, <laughs> But I had a, uh, when I was a young, young I had a, a South African English teacher when I was growing up in Israel who must have taught me some vowels that I uh, still stick with me to this day. <laughs> okay, thanks. There's a question, by the way, that I posted that accidentally got moved to answer that I think is also relevant. Luke, if we can, shall I answer that? Um, yeah, by all I'll ask it, sorry, that's a, a question for thing wrongling, but you know, so why, why penalties rather than rewards to incentivize? Um, uh, and I think it's sort of related to some of the other questions. Yeah, this is just the use of word. <laughs> so when we, uh, 
that was a study main contributor uh, was a uh, mathematician. So penalty is a terminology they use quite often, not a reward. That's why we use that terminology. So you can have a negative penalty, right? When it becomes a reward. Exactly. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Well, we have a hard stop at uh, five twenty-five. I'm I'm, not, I'm monitoring the the chat. I, I fear that uh, um, I've uh, done an injustice to uh, Robert Dickinson and not characterised his question appropriately. So apologies for that, um, Robert. If you want to contact the team afterwards, we'll we'll attempt to have another 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 run at the uh, the question that you posed. If we went off on a on a on a, on a tangent on. I'm sorry for that, um, but uh, we are wrapping up. Uh, do any of our panelists have any final thoughts or or, uh, or areas which they would like to highlight that our, that our uh, hardy uh, hardy participants that have stuck it through to the end at uh, at five twenty two on a on a Thursday afternoon um, should be aware of? I suppose from my point of view, I'm just very interested to know what uh, what else is out there. So we've done a number of um, pieces of work at the moment, just setting ourselves up here at Race for 2030. And, uh, and if there is anything else that we, we should be aware of that's happened over the last few months, it's an ever changing field. I just would encourage people to be in touch. Uh, and, and if there are any particular research projects that you think must happen to, to make this work for Australia, given that we have our unique context or particular mm. businesses, please, please do reach out. It's a really good point and an exciting role we can play here in Australia because we are, well, you know, the, the problems that we face here aren't necessarily unique. They are particular and we are at kind of the bleeding edge um, with the, with the, you know, the, how rapidly jurisdictions are, are uh, grappling with uh, high levels of uh, renewable penetration in particular and making, making it just imperative that we're using all the tools in our toolbox. So, um, look, uh, on behalf of, uh, of uh, Ariel and myself, I'll, I'll thank, uh, uh, Rongling, Stephen, and uh, and Danny, uh, we really appreciate you making the time. We know you're all incredibly busy. Uh, the, the many people that, that have dialed in around Australia and will be catching up on this uh, this recording over coming days and weeks. Um, uh, uh, really appreciative of, of your contribution, um, both on this webinar but also just day to day um, as you uh, as you dig into this important topic and um, bring your insult, insights to bear on these these challenging problems and opportunities that we're all working our way through. So thank you. And uh, I will uh, I will hand over to Ariel for a final thought in a moment, but just on behalf of the Energy Efficiency Council, I want to reiterate um, how, how thrilled we are to be partnering on this webinar with, with Erica, with uh, the Monash, Monash Energy Institute. Um, it, it's an incredibly important agenda and, and looking forward to continuing the collaboration to make sure we build up that connective tissue between policymakers, uh, between businesses, uh, householders, and um, indeed uh, researchers uh, around around the country. And a shout out, Ariel, I think is in order for, for Kate and Nancy, who uh, have done all the work on the Indeed. back end. Um, and all we have to do is, is roll in and uh, and oh, we're good. So- um, Tremendous. Um, you, uh, yeah, thanks, Luke. And uh, you know, also thank, thank you to Nancy and Kate. Uh, or quite intricate work in the background that's hard to see, including some of the words that uh, I don't know about you, Luke, but I certainly use some of the words written for me by uh, Nancy. And so also um, thanks to Luke and the Energy Efficiency Council for reaching out to Erica and, um, and uh, uh, you know, really um, showing that we can work together with industry. I think um, that's the message I'd like to, um, to, to kind of leave you with is that uh, time is for more collaboration between research sector, including CSIRO, not just the universities, but also CSIRO and the other labs. Do we have other labs in Australia? I know that you know, I keep uh, thinking of the US with like 20 different energy labs. Um, we've got CSIRO. So yeah, reach out to us, CRC, Erica, other universities, not in the CRC, but in Erica, all of us are standing by to, to help. Uh, and uh, keep an eye out for the energy transition research plan that's being worked through at the moment by the Australian Council of Learned Academies, ACOLA. Just go to the acola.org website. I think that's the and um, the State of the Energy State of Energy Research Conference. And this year will be um, a, a, a lot of it will be about outworking the opportunities and agenda for for the national research program developed 
by by ECOLA, and uh, that's chaired by Drew Clark, who's also the chair of the Australian Energy Market Operator. So very much uh, on the money. So thank you, everyone. And um, thanks, uh, Ron Wing, Danny, Stephen, and the rest of the team. And uh, I guess we sign off here. Wonderful. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you, everybody that's participated in uh, today's session. And uh, we'll see you again soon.